Thank you very much for attending, Gil. Um, how did you, we'll give a little bit about your background. How did you get started in Silicon Valley? Uh, so like a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm an engineer that eventually ended up going to a startup and uh, I, I was starting my own companies in pretty much high school, college. Every time you gave me a textbook, I would turn around and start trying to do something. And uh, I ended up starting a website for frequent flyers to trade miles. Uh, which is not a very scalable business, but made a lot of money. And uh, from that, learned about the idea that people could buy and sell things online and ran into some people at eBay who were trying to convince people that people would buy and sell online back in the 90s when no one accepted a credit card. Uh, joined eBay in 98, 98, uh, and sort of it's been tech startups and angel investing ever since. Wow. Um can you remember what your first angel investment was? Yeah, uh, I got very lucky. Um, these handful of guys came to talk to me about the Pepsi machine in Finland. And apparently Nokia had been working with Pepsi in Finland to put a phone number on the Pepsi machine so that you could call the Pepsi machine. Uh, Finn Telecom would debit 45 cents from your phone and Pepsi would come out. And they're like, we're gonna let anyone use any of their phones or iPads. Well, back then it was, you know, what was it, Palm Pilots? We're gonna basically let you beam money from your Palm Pilot or your Nokia phone through the infrared port to a Pepsi machine. We're gonna give it away for free and we're gonna sell Pepsi server software. I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. I don't know anything about it, but like, sure, I'll put 10 grand in that. Uh, that, that company, Confinity, later changed its name to PayPal. Like, who knew? It was enterprise software for Pepsi machines. So your first investment um, turned into PayPal. Um, what was your second investment? <laughs> that one wasn't as good. I've, I think I've forgotten that one. But uh, in the pantheon of shitty 1990 deals, uh, I would include the platform for anyone to become a radio shock jock back in 98, 99, when broadband was so shitty that you couldn't listen to this stuff anyway. So I, I didn't really understand that, you know, the internet had limits on what it could do. Uh, and a bunch of other shitty ones like that. In total, how many startups have you invested? Do you actually keep track of how many? Uh, so I, I only became a quote unquote professional investor it's still technically not true, um, about two and a half years ago. So prior to that, like I had a, a file where I just left paperwork that I never tracked. Um, so I, I don't know for sure, but when I signed up on AngelList, I went through the file and just tried to pull out all the names. And at last count, it's somewhere north of 100, somewhere between 100 and 200. Wow. And now you are really kind of focusing more professionally on angel investing. You run flight that you see on AngelList. And you're kind of using, you are using AngelList as kind of a venture platform. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, how many people know about AngelList? Just so I've, okay, so most. Um, so I started out on AngelList basically because Naval went around to a bunch of people early in the syndicate launch and was like, hey, you should do this. Uh, it's a way for all your friends to pile in and invest with you. And, and I was kind of like, oh, okay, that, you know, that sounds nice. Uh, and he says, and then strangers might come in too and you can charge them fees. And, and I remember looking at Naval and going, oh, so I can charge strangers for joining, but I can give it away to my friends for free. And he's like, yeah, no, we don't know how to do that. You'll just have to charge everyone. And I was like, oh, so I can screw over my friends. And he gives me that look that he has since given me 20 or 30 times in the last two years where he's just like, why are you such a pain in the ass? Uh, and he's like, you'll just do it. And so I, I launched my first syndicate and a uh, bunch of people signed up to back me and I called a friend of mine and I said, hey, uh, you know that 25 grand I gave you for that convertible note is okay if I put a little more in? And my friend Max says, sure, how much? And I said, well, somewhere between zero and half a million dollars. And I get that look again. 
He's like, that's really weird. What are you talking about? And I said, well, I don't actually know how much is going to show up, right? I mean, at this point, this is September, October of 2013, one of my backers is actually Mickey Mouse. I mean, Mickey Mouse has a user ID, he's got the ears, <laughs> and he's backing me for $2,500. Like, Does he have a bank account? He did not have a bank account. Uh, and so I'm looking at this amount of money that Angelus says I can raise, and I'm going, yeah, it's just not true, but I don't know how much of it's not true. Um, and we ended up raising 200 something thousand, uh, which I was honestly shocked by. I thought like 12 bucks would show up. Um, and, you know, fast forward two and a half years, we now run 29 different syndicates. I find entrepreneurs, uh, you know, CEOs, VPs of engineering, VPs of sales. I was just on the phone with one uh, before coming in here who want to run their own syndicates. And I basically help them become larger investors and talk them through deals if they want help. Uh, some of them don't. Um, and just help people I like write bigger checks. And so we've been trying, to, the group, Sean and I and others, have been trying to sort of expand the definition of what you can do on AngelList. It was initially, you know, small angel checks piling into someone else's investment, right? Like, so in 2014, we led the first deal where we actually wrote a term sheet and, uh, and were able to take the lead position away from a VC and take a board seat. Uh, in 2015, we started putting money into A rounds and B rounds and C rounds, and then I ran out of fingers, so we started doing common, which is how I ended up here. Um, and so now we're kind of like a VC firm, but weirder. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, I, I try to describe it as like an armada. There are 29 different seed funds all running around with people I know and like, all putting money to work in whatever they want. And the difference between what we do in a VC firm, you know, I've gone out and talked to the people who give money to VC firms, the LPs, and they're looking at usually two dorky white guys in black, blue jackets and saying, why should I trust you with $5 million? I have no idea what you'll do with it. Whereas on AngelList, you sign up to my newsletter or someone else's newsletter and you see every deal and you see the price and you get to say yes or no. And so the, the burden of proof on the syndicate lead is so much lower than it is on the two dorky white guys um, that I think that's, that trust is much easier to build and it seems to be working. And so um, normally when investors buy um, stock, they generally end up buying preferred stock with preferred rights. There aren't a set standard set of preferred rights. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned in the email uh, when we were talking about this event was how the preferred rights tend to change as the startup continues to raise larger and larger amounts of money. Um, can you talk a little bit about that progression? Yeah. Um, so I've been on both sides of the table. We can talk about that at some point, too. I've, I've bought Common I've, for a syndicate, and I've sold Common as an individual, and I've bought Common as the CEO from employees who left. So I've been... I think I've pretty much seen every version of this other than the guys who loan you money on Common. Um, so I'll, I'll put my investor hat on for a minute. Hey, you know, Gil, I'd love to sell you some Common stock in this company I just founded six months ago. Uh, and I sort of look at you and go, no. And you ask, well, why not? Like, it's still stock. Don't you want some? Right? And I go, okay, so at some point you're going to do a seed and then you're going to do an A, and then you're going to do a B, and a C, and all of those guys get paid back before the common sees a dollar. And that's in a good era where there is normal preferred, what's called you know, 1x liquidation preference. You know, in a bad era, like if Q4 and Q1 had kept going and the market hadn't come back, um, when I was a CEO, I, got, we, I was laying off people in 2008 in the last downturn, and one of my board members comes to me and says, hey, you know, if you need a couple million dollars, like, we'd be happy to chip a little more in and, you know, be supportive. I was like, wow, that's awesome. Like, sure, send me over, like, some thoughts. And he sends me over a document that says if he puts two million in, he gets the first 12 million back. <laughs> which in VC lawyer land is called 6X liquidation preference. Now the company goes public, none of that matters. But what investors know is very few companies go public. Lots and lots of companies get sold. 
why not get a free 6X on top of whatever my normal return would be? So the fear when you're buying common is there's all this like crud that attaches to the bottom of the boat as the boat continues to sit in the water. Um, so you know, multiple liquidation preferences one. As you get to later stage, you start to see Tiger and Fidelity and other guys doing guaranteed returns. So Tiger's like, we don't care what the pre-money is as long as we make at least 20% a year. Like, so our docs are gonna say 20% a year or else. Uh, if you wanna learn more about that, read some of the commentary on the Square IPO where they basically were given a bunch of extra stock the day of the IPO because they hadn't met that threshold. And so that makes it really hard to value common early on because you just have no idea what's gonna happen. But weirdly enough, it actually makes it really hard to value common late because if I was looking at Square's common, I would have seen that last round at five billion and thought, well shit, that's the valuation. But it wasn't. It was at least 20% return or five billion. And so those guys effectively bought into Square, if you do the math, at like three billion, but no one knew that unless they read the term sheet and the legal docs from the last round. And that's not part of the IPO disclosure necessarily. I think it might have been, but if you're buying common, nobody's gonna fucking tell you that. And the employee generally doesn't know because no one tells the employees they're getting screwed over. And so um, what would actually possess you to purchase common stock in a company? Uh, well, to be fair, actually the first few times I did it, I'm not sure I knew all of this. Uh, so I'm not as smart as I look. Um, so I looked at it and said, well, Preferred has all these goodies. Yeah, I'll buy some common at a discount to the last round. So the guys who put in money last time, you know, they bought it 10 bucks a share, give it to me at seven or eight. You know, I feel like I'm getting a discount that makes up for the risk that in some circumstances, those guys will do better than I do. Um, so like one King's Lane sold and, you know, the preferred didn't even get all their money back, common got nothing. Guilt Group interestingly sold for exactly the amount the preferred had put in to the dollar, which tells you the board members at Guilt Group were making sure they were getting their money back and didn't negotiate for an extra dollar for the employees. Um, so I, I probably underpriced the risk at the time, um, but, but I did say, hey, I wanna see the Series A and Series B term sheets and see what sort of preference they had uh, and the last deal I did common in, uh, Venrock and some East Coast firm I've heard of, TCB maybe, they're pretty benign firms. They do relatively clean, normal deals. And so I read the term sheets. So I was like, okay, this is sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, I should have, you know, asked for a bigger discount. I didn't. It turned out okay anyway because we ended up buying... 20% discount to the B round in Dollar Shave Club. They went on and raised a C and then Unilever bought them for a billion dollars. And now I look like a genius, despite the fact that, honestly, I, I priced it wrong. I should have asked for a bigger discount. Mm -hmm. um, have you actually bought preferred stock from other investors that wanted to get some liquidity and can you talk about that process? That's in some ways easier because a preferred investor often has information rights and can get you more of the information you want, cap tables, prior round, legal docs, and stuff like that. Um, I haven't. I looked at a couple of tranches of Uber from the Series A or B, but they're just too big for my pocketbook, I guess. Um, but in theory, you're getting a little more protection um, but if you talk like Bill Gurley had a good post on this that, you know, he's like, hey, we're benchmark. We typically do the Series A. By the time you get to the D, Series A looks a lot like common. And what he means by that is I bought my preferred shares at $2, so I'm guaranteed 2 bucks in a sale. But the current price of Uber stock is 40 bucks. So if you buy Series A preferred at 40 bucks or even a discount to 40 bucks, you've only got $2 worth of protection on it. And so the early investors preferred actually starts to look like common in some ways. That's actually interesting. One of the, one of the questions that I've had on my SEC committee is, you know, 
employees actually invest blood, sweat, and tears into a company, investors put capital to work. Um, does the SEC work on protecting employees' rights? Um, and the, the answer has been resoundingly deafening. Um, but I wonder, have you, like, how often do you think that your employees and your portfolio companies don't do well? Don't do nearly as well as the investors. I don't. I don't know that I have a good answer. So let me poke around at the question a little. Yeah. Um, so when I'm an investor and the CEO's like, "Dude, why don't you just buy Common? Like, I have Common. What's wrong with Common?" I have a really easy answer, which is, you have eighty percent of the stock, and I have twenty percent, and so you can vote for all sorts of things that could totally fuck me over, like issuing more stock to yourself. That would make me really sad, right? So a lot of these protective provision preference things are to protect the minority shareholder against the majority. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't have a really good answer for that one. I mean, I think you could probably get an investor to invest without participating preferred and get something weaker. I've seen that. Um, I think it would actually be very reasonable to say, hey, if employees buy their stock options, maybe they could get at least preference on the cash they put in. Like that would seem really fair to me. Um, but I'm also like, I just had a couple deals where I was preferred, I invested a bunch of money, the company had an aqua hire, and I saw $0. And the employees did really well because they got aqua hired and they got big stock packages. And so I, I think it's really, and, and believe me, I'm, I'm actually not angry. One of them is a friend of mine and he totally fucked me over, quote unquote. But I'm not upset about it. Like he was doing the right thing and the choice was bankruptcy or aqua hire. Like it's not like there was a better option. Right? It would have been nice if I could have gotten five cents back, but at the end of the day, five cents versus zero really is kind of a lame result no matter what. Like, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't have like, been thrilled over five cents back. So I, I kind of chalk that up to like, well, that one didn't work. So like, you know, bad deal. Makes sense. Um, in your portfolio of private stock now, um, how, like, out of how many stocks that you buy or how many investments that you buy, do you keep track of like roughly what, how many of those get liquid? Well, keeping track of which ones get liquid is really easy, right? Because there there are only a handful that go public. There are a bunch that get bought by another company that isn't public, and there's a bunch that go to shit. Um, you know, probably half my portfolio is stuff that you know a VC would call the living dead, which is they're kind of puttering around and they're never going to go anywhere, but they're too dumb not to die. Because yeah, I'm a big fan of actually like if it isn't working, go home. Like, just go home and do something else. Like, why keep, I ran into, oh, it's a funny one for you. I ran into the head of marketing from Wine.com. Anyone ever heard of Wine.com? Raised 50 million in the 90s. Still going. Uh, the head of marketing ran into her at the battery. We were having drinks. I was like, how's it going? She's like, oh, it's great. We're killing it. It's like an amazing company. I love it so much. I was like, huh. What are you doing in sales? She goes, 90 million this year. I was like, huh, that's less than one Costco. <laughs> like one. You're 16 years in, you spent $50 million. Like, go home. No one cares. <laughs> like, those people have some talents. They could be applied to something useful. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... And I'm speaking as the guy who would get a zero instead of 10 cents on the dollar. But at some point, like, I'd rather get the tax deduction. <laughs> Seriously, like. Um, in cases like that, I've actually been hearing of a number of, like, private equity funds that are actually starting to pick up some of those companies. Um, have you had those types of M&A transactions? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's occasional roll-ups and in fact I think the guy talking next will probably know a lot more about that than, than I do um, internet brands bought all kinds of wacky shit in their plan to go public 
and uh, I, I'll tell you a funny one. So I was an investor in a vacation rental search engine. A friend of mine was like, it's really hard to find good vacation properties. A lot of people have their own websites. I'm gonna build a search engine that's gonna have like characteristics like bedrooms and bathrooms and location and zip code. It was actually a pretty good service. Like it's very hard to get anyone to come to a search engine. So it was growing kind of shitty. And he calls me and he goes, Internet Brands wants to buy us. And I was like, Internet Brands is a private piece of shit that owns Cars Direct and some, what was it? It was, and some real estate sites. They had bought like three or four different real estate sites and they own Cars Direct. Like, there's no way we want that stock. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 they're paying cash. I was like, take it, take it right away. And then after he took it, we got the check. I was like, by the way, why were they buying it? And he's like, well, their bankers said that if they could say they were in auto, real estate, and travel, which are the three biggest markets, they'd probably get a better valuation when they went public. I was like, okay. Like, I don't understand banker, but that sounds really ridiculous. <laughs> um, so sometimes people buy things for stupid reasons. Um, the more traditional roll-up is, is HomeAway, which bought 15 vacation rental sites. My old company, Wikia, which bought like 50 other Wiki sites. Uh, and those make sense because you're, you're, you have a product and you're just buying other of the same fucking thing. The one that seems to work less well is the IACs of the world who own 12 cats and dogs. Um, and I will tell you, because I've talked to the IAC Corp Dev guy, because I was like, hey, I've got some cats and dogs. Maybe you'd want to <laughs> buy them too. Um, they buy things at like three times cash flow. Wow. And to put that in perspective, gas stations trade at like five times cash flow. So you can sell the IAC, but it, it's not going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and they do buy things. Very interesting. Um, what have you actually seen um, kill um, acquisitions and mergers and acquisitions? Uh, everything. I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, there's a board member who has a veto who goes, no, God damn it, I need this to be big because it's good for my ego or I'll get fired if I have too many of these shitty base hits. Like, I've talked to founders who are like, I'm fucking tired of VCs not letting me sell. Uh, sometimes it's CEO ego. Sometimes people just lie about how they're doing. Sometimes the company thinks it's really cool, and then some internal politics fucks things up. So I, I was going to be four for four. Uh, I was going to be very proud of my record of every company I've worked at has been awesome. Uh, because eBay did pretty well, and Wikia did pretty well, and Fastly's doing really well. And then I founded this company, Vouch, uh, with a couple friends of mine to do consumer lending. And we raised like 10 million bucks, and we grew like crazy, and we were having trouble raising another round just as Lending Club was falling off the cliff. Uh, nobody wanted to talk, to talk fintech to anyone. And so we went out looking for someone to buy us, and all the smart people said no. So we ended up talking to banks. <laughs> um, and the smart banks said no, so we ended up talking to BBVA, which is a Spanish bank <laughs> that serves really good food. Uh, and they came in, they were really interested, um, and we all thought, like, Jesus, this is awesome. Maybe we'll get our 10 million bucks back. Maybe we'll get half our 10 million bucks back. Uh, and they were making noise about like wanting to take care of investors and not just employees. They really loved the team. And the CEO comes to the investors and is like, "Hey, we're gonna. This is gonna take a little longer than we thought. We need like another four weeks of money just to you know make payroll because our only asset is the team." And everyone's like, "Well, it all sounds really good, sure." So you know, another month's money gets wired over by me and some other investors. And on day 29 of 30, they sent a term sheet for $1. We're willing to buy the company for a dollar. And the CEO says, like, I need another 15 days of money because, like, it's going to take a while to get from term sheet to docs. And everyone's like, so you want us to put money in knowing we're not going to get any money out? 
yeah, I guess we kind of have to, right? Board seats come with some liability and responsibility and not just like free Danish and coffee. Um, and so we all chip in a little more money to get to close and the bank walks away. And I'm like, who the fuck walks away from a dollar? <laughs> Really? <laughs> so like all kinds of shit fucks up m and I mean, like who knows? Um, the only thing I know from having to try to sell, sell my last company is you can't sell a company, you have to find a buyer. Like you can't say I'm for sale, who wants me? Right, you spend years getting to know people who might be good buyers and trying to build relationships with them um, or you do the desperate dance that you know does happen, and and uh, happened to a friend of mine here, and happened to uh, you know the, this travel search engine I mentioned, where like some strange people come out of the woodwork looking for aqua hires, uh, and now is sort of an aqua hire time. It seems like everyone is aqua hiring because they think everyone's failing, and it's really hard to hire. So it's sort of. It's one of the rare times where I feel like you could actually just put up your hand and some people might show up to kick the tires, but that is not normal. Uh, I mean, I tried to sell a company. I spent six months baiting people and everyone was like, Meh. no. Like literally got no interest, let alone bids. How many, like when you've actually done that, how many buyers do you typically go out and talk to? It depends. I mean, if, you, if you're talking to people you know who have expressed interest in the past, it could be two or three. I helped a friend of mine. You know, she had been talking to two and then called a couple that seemed like they might fit just to, like, try to drum up a little more interest. I've also seen people hire some dude who used to be a banker to call 40. And, you know, 30 of them ignore it and 10 of them kick the tires just to see if there's anything to learn. Uh, it's just, it's, there's no science on that one. It's like, what's our team? What's our product? Who might want either of them? Hmm. Um, how much as an investor, how much work do you actually put into your portfolio companies in trying to get liquidity when the companies are actually interested in it? Like how active are you in terms of like trying to get an exit for your companies? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there's not much I can do. I can open doors. I can ping people and say, hey. Right? There's not really a ton I can do. Oh, totally cool. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, some of what you talked about, the m and how to do, looks like, right? if you are mastering that, I understand, looks like an active talk. Are a desperate company. That's not how M&A is done, right? M&A is done, the left hand is turning to the right. This metaphorically as simple as that, they're all same network and you, I, I, hey, you got money from me before and now you're going to get paid back, that's the kind of thing. So what kind of thing, with the same question I'm going to ask you back and say, what would you do differently than going and opening the doors and so on to be more actively looking at company valuation from the almost, you know, the first six months, one year, whenever it is, start thinking of it and then thinking of the suitors on a regular basis rather than thinking off the card, you're losing money, you don't know what to do. That's the last thing to do. It's almost like the sustaining game very close to dead bodies. Again, don't think there's a formula. I mean, when you're getting started, if you're spending time thinking about who's going to acquire you, you're already fucked because you barely have time to do anything. As you get bigger, you get inbound from people who are interested. Most of them want what I call adult education, right? They want to come by and do a tour and see the office and have you explain to them how your business works so they can learn. Um, and so my rule of thumb was like, ignore adult education calls unless they call twice and on the second time ask them why and like push back on like, do you really want to meet with me? Like, okay, you come here because I'm too busy to go to you. And so, but 
you know, over time, you're, you're trying to build relationships with people in the ecosystem. I was pretty unusual in that I actually used angel investing as a way to build my network, and so I would invest in anything around me so that I had information on everybody around me and relationships with everyone around me, and so that gave me better radar and better access to a, a lot of people. Um, but yeah, it's just networking, right? And networking takes time, and most of it's useless. And so it's a prioritization problem. Networking is driving me crazy. I want marketplaces for everything. Um, any other question? I'm just kind of curious for your insights in the Twitter and why that hasn't been disrupted and why they haven't been able to really move that company. In terms of selling it? Yeah, just you know, kind of in the context of what you're talking about. Maybe like if you were an early investor, like what would you be doing? Yeah, I mean, I guess early on, I was, one of the few things that was shocking to me about Twitter early on, given how often it went down with the fail whale, was that there, I never saw a competitor. Like, there was no number two, and this is a business we're in where normally there are six guys going after anything that looks half-baked, right? Like, there was no number, I could never, like, I was at South by Southwest, where was the number two? Didn't see them. Um, I think real-time search was a fundamentally pretty hard problem um, that two guys at YC had trouble building. So maybe that's why. Then Facebook came and basically, you know, destroyed them by creating the news feed. Uh, and I think that took most of the oxygen out of what Twitter could have been. Um, and today I think the problem is, you know, to the point, like Twitter has relationships with everyone. It's not clear why anybody wants it, right? Like. Who's going to buy Twitter? So Microsoft doesn't give a shit anymore. Google can't because of antitrust. Amazon doesn't give a shit. Like, so who, who, for whom are they useful? Like, I, you know, my best guess is at some point Verizon gets bored and buys another one. <laughs> right? And then it's like, well, why not Twitter? I mean, it's, you know, it's just as shitty as the next... <laughs> you know, AOL or Yahoo or whatever else they bought that they fucked up. So um, it seems like AT&T has decided not to go into a suicide grudge match on that one. Um, I'm actually a little surprised Sprint hasn't, now that SoftBank owns them. Um, it seems like Verizon's kind of out on their own buying cats and dogs. So to me, I, I sort of look at Twitter and I go, it's like Verizon, IAC, who doesn't really have the market cap for it. Like, Alibaba, because they're bored. Like, there just aren't many good players who can afford that price. And really, all you're getting is like more ads, and the world is awash in ads. So, like, it, it's not, I mean, the street keeps putting a premium on the stock because they assume someone's going to buy it. Because I would have said the same thing about LinkedIn, without a doubt. And I know everyone at LinkedIn. Like, Microsoft was never on the list of people they would sell to. Like, it wasn't strategically obvious. And then it happened anyway. Does that answer it, or? Yeah. Yeah. There's a question over here. Yeah, could you discuss a little bit about the fee structure in the uh, syndicate world, um, especially with AJOS, it seems to be very high. 20% uh, uh, is the carry, plus uh, some fees, management fees on top of that. By the end, uh, the investor gets hit for anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of his investment. Yeah, it's totally fucking ridiculous. You should never do that. <laughs> um, I mean, like, I won't even pay for mutual funds or ETFs. Like, I buy stocks one at a time and I put them away and I tell those brokers to go kiss my ass. Um, so, like, I think the fees are high. I think they are lower than the fees I pay in the venture capital funds I'm in. So I'm putting money into, like, I don't know, two or three different venture capital funds. Um, the big ones are now two and 30. And what that means is they take 2% a year for eight to 10 years. So they take about 20 cents on every dollar for salaries and expenses. Um, and then after taking all of that money for salaries and expenses, they tell me as the startup that I have to pay their legal fees when they do a deal. Like, that's the one that still pisses me off. Um, but back to ridiculous fees. 
Um, then they take 30% of any profits. And not 20. Two and 30 is the new norm for the big guys. The little guys are two and 20, two and a half and 20. Uh, but like Kleiner, Excel, Greylock, Andreessen, they've all moved to two and 30. Um, there's a couple of hedge funds that actually have two and 40. Um, and you know, the market will pay for it. I, I don't know why. Um, other than like Sequoia always returns good returns. So I guess you just keep paying for it. So relative to that, zero and 20 is relatively low. You do pay an $8,000 per deal setup fee for all their legal bullshit. Um, but I didn't know this originally. The VC funds actually tack on legal fees to their fund investors too. I was like, wait, isn't that in the 2%? They're like, no, 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 no. That's, the 2% is for us. Um, and I've met with a bunch of their LPs now over the years, and no one complains about the fees. They all complain about performance, right? Their argument is like, I need to make this amount of money. I don't really care how rich you get in the process. Um, so the syndicate is in many ways less costly, but you're also in theory getting someone who works less hard to help your company. So it's not entirely clear to me how the trade-off works uh, long-term. I, I think it's more like, you know, I pick an actively managed mutual fund versus I buy stocks on E-Trade, right? Angelus to me is more like E-Trade. I get to pick what I'm gonna lose or make money on, and I've got no one to blame but myself, and the fees are lower, but they're still pretty ridiculous. Um, and as an aside, I some of my SEC work, um, California actually charges $800 a year for an LLC. So the SPVs, my guess is that they're charging the $800 a year for 10 years, yep. which is $8,000, just to be able to pay the California state taxes on that. Yeah, it, I mean, there, I can give you lots of heuristics and then I try to remember that VCs investing in companies is a lot like dating. Like you can say the three things you're looking for in a guy and then you end up dating someone completely different. Um, and like it's just, it's this strange, you know, it's essentially a multi-attribute matching problem and there's too many attributes. Um, but if I use some generic like rules of thumb, uh, in SaaS it used to be 100K a month MRR, now it's more like 200. Unless you're super hot and kind of awesome, right? In consumer apps it used to be a million users and now it's 10 million users because everyone has a million users. And so 10 million is the new 1 million. Uh, you know, and a lot of it's also just growth rate. Like in SaaS, if you're growing less than 10% a month, nobody really cares. Uh, the hot consumer companies tend to be growing, like and I, when I'm talking hot, right? Like, hot, like the, the company where I go, I don't need to know anything else, I would like to write you a check right now, grows 1% a day, which compounded is about 50% monthly, right? You're growing 50% a month, even on, you know, 50,000, 100,000 users, I don't care. Like, that's fucking crazy, and I gotta get in there and find out why. But in fact, I was, I was at a dinner last night with a, a friend from Greylock who was saying something like that. Like, if I see this certain virality metric, like, I don't ask any questions, I don't ask what the price is, I just, like, try to throw money at this guy. So, um, you know, viral customer acquisition or organic customer acquisition, is sort of a key determinant of success in consumer. You know, SaaS is more CAC to LTV and a certain scale. Um, and then late stage guys are even more scale focused, but they all seem to have these rules like, and if you think of like 200 in SaaS as an example, it's not that they won't do something below 200, it's that the person you're talking to says to himself, 
if I do something next week at 200 and it goes bad, I can say, well, you know, it's venture capital, that's how it works. But if I do a deal at 50K that I really like and it goes bad, they're gonna say, you're the idiot. Like, why do you still work here? Right, so if you break the heuristic, you're allowed to, but if you break it and you fail, it's much riskier for your career as an investor. And luckily I don't have a career, so I don't, I don't worry about it as much. Can you talk a little bit about how um, standards have changed in terms of like the Series A-ish benchmark um, over the last, I don't know, X years? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really all a function of, of Moore's Law and, you know, compute cost, right? So in 98, when CMGI offered me $2 million to start my new company, it was on PowerPoint. Like, I showed them this cool PowerPoint. They thought it was cool. They offered me $2 million. Uh, I was very lucky and said no and stayed at eBay a few more years because uh, it was a really bad idea. Uh, but back then, it, you'd spend one, two, three, four million dollars building a website. Like, you're buying Sun servers and Oracle databases and, like, three guys in, you know, carpenter pants to install and maintain everything. Um, and so, you know, AWS changed it a lot, right? So circa 06, you could start a website for $50 or $100 or $500. And, and now it's literally like $5. Right, I mean, you can get an app in the App Store for free and you can have a back-end database that costs effectively nothing on GCS because you don't even need an instance. And so today, you know, I have people who come to me and they're like, look at this awesome PowerPoint. We have this great idea. And I go, why the fuck would I pay for that? Like, go spend 50 bucks and see if it works. Like, seriously, spend 50 bucks and see if it works. Um, and they're like, no, it's really hard. We have to find a programmer. Okay, so find a programmer. Like, they're on Elance. They're on Odesk. They're in every coffee shop in town. If you can't find someone to do some part-time work with you, like, you're not a very good salesman. And, and I will say, having been a, a founder a few times now, um, I would often joke, and, you know, please don't take me seriously on this, but I would often joke that being a founder of a startup is a lot like starting a Ponzi scheme because you are lying to your friends to convince them to join you to do this suicidally stupid thing. <laughs> and then you're using that as traction to lie to customers and tell them to use this product that probably won't be here in three months. And then you use that traction to lie to investors and tell them to give you money that they clearly shouldn't. And as soon as you get the money, you lie to more people to come join you to, so you can lie to more customers to grow. And, you know, unlike Madoff and the Ponzi scheme, which always ends badly, you know, this only ends badly like 90% of the time. Like 10% of the time it works really well. Um, but I, I remember nights where I would go home and tell my wife, like, I feel like a liar. Like, I feel like everything I said today was a lie. Like, I lied to my employees. I lied to my customers. Like, like, it's just not true. Like, and she's like, yeah, that's called vision. It's like, well, it doesn't feel so good. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, just a uh, friendly comment. You should be on the television. You are very, very good on that. I just want to make sure you are very, very clear, safe comment. Well, I, I have been told that I have both the voice and the face for radio and not television. <laughs> um, Although, funny enough, a friend of mine has recommended me on a judge for some new CBS show that I think will be a catastrophe, so you may actually be right. What are the areas, I'm not asking for your investment, overall in the industry, what are the areas where it's over-invested, no one, no one will invest anymore, it's too late in the bandwagon, versus what is something new that if this was there, someone may invest, I'm not talking about you, right, overall. Yeah, the overinvested one is hard because it's kind of everything. <laughs> I mean, with you know interest rates at zero percent, everything is overinvested. In. But but if I had to pick a category, I really don't want to see any more of. It would be subscription commerce of more dog food type shit, um, or the seventy fifth photo hosting site, which I would have said about Instagram. So I'm clearly not as right. I mean, like, there's just so many of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, fair enough. 
Um, what I think is very interesting is, you know, and, and this is not surprising, but VR, AR, self-driving cars, uh, all have one thing in common, which is a new type of computing around a GPU. So artificial intelligence and, and all of this basically comes out of the fact that you can now do these massive parallel computing things. Uh, and so we were like, we were talking uh, at this conference yesterday, and we we're like, what's new within there? And we're all like, yeah, it's kind of the same shit. Everyone's basically doing image recognition. Like almost all VR, AR, AI, machine learning I've seen recently has been some form of image rec recognition. It's x-ray image, image recognition for doctors and it's speed bump image recognition for cars. Uh, and the, so the conversation we had that we didn't get to a good answer on is like, what else is this fancy GPU-y thing good for? Like, what, what other tricks can machine learning do that no one has thought of? Uh, like, and, and the one comment I got that I liked was someone said, I make 10,000 bad decisions a day. It would be nice to have something in my ear telling me not to, right? Like, don't turn here, don't buy that product. So I thought it was, you know, cute. Yes, sir. You prior last September mentioned that we are in a pre-market -mark, pre VIPO bubble that would take 12 to 18 months to go bust and that funders should make an MRR that would cover them for the next 24 months after that. So that was pretty catastrophic. And now uh, we're 12 months gone, and maybe the next six, or maybe this was a maybe next. I want your take on that, and I want to know how do you say for a rainy day, because we all know there will be rainy days. If you're a fund founder, yeah, so it depends where you are in the ocean. Um, you know, my joke when I was running a Series A company in 2008 was like, I don't care how big the waves are in the ocean, I'm crawling on the bottom of the ocean floor. Like, I just, I don't see any of those waves up there, right? So the pre-IPO uh, problem is there are like a hundred unicorns who would all like to go public and the public markets will maybe eat five or ten of them. Right, so New Relic got out, Splunk got out. There's a hundred, like Instacart would love to be public. Nobody gives a shit. So if you're late stage, you have to go to a very small number of people who can write $100 million checks. And those people just got a lot pickier and are saying no sometimes, which is so weird. Like when did they ever start doing that? Right, and so if they say no, you're fucked. Um, if you're Series A, there's still plenty of Series A money out. It, ha you know, it slowed down a little in Q1, and tempo seems to have come right back, and prices are a little lower, and people are a little pickier, and there's all these bridge guys running around giving you money if you can't quite get there. So, so I think if I was seed, I'm trying to raise 12 to 18 months. Um, if I'm A, I'm trying to raise 18-ish. I get more nervous as I get to B and C that it would be nice to have a longer runway because the big check guys, there's just fewer of them right now. Um, but also having been an operator, the other way I look at it is I go, I always have 12 months of money in the bank because it's just a question of how many people I have to fire. So I don't ever want to have less than 12 months of money in the bank. I mean, when 2008 and 9 came, you know, I sat down with my board and I was like, okay, so we're going to cut the cost in half. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, like now. Because I have like 12 months of money in the bank and next month I'm going to have nine because revenue is not growing and every other cost is. Right? So I always in the back of my head have a, like, have the, you know, the oh shit plan as my other way to avoid raising 24 months of money because 24 is a lot and I can't fucking predict 12 months out. But I, I do think if your burn is big and the check you need for 12 months is humongous, he's right, because there just are not that many places to get it. Why do you, why do you think that companies are waiting so long to IPO? I mean, if there's so many billion dollar companies that are waiting to IPO now, wouldn't it make sense to IPO at like $300 million? No. 
Love your songs. Uh, Amazon went public at 300. eBay went public at 600. I think Twilio went public around 600. So, yeah, you know, on the other hand, Facebook went public at 50 billion. So, I, I mean, it feels like a billion plus is sort of the new marker for where the market prefers things to go public. So, the guys at three and 600 can't. Um, I think the bigger problem is there's 80 guys who want to get out, and there's like three banks that matter, right? Goldman, Morgan, and I don't know, somebody else. Um, and they're only going to shill so many bad ideas to their customers. And so they're out talking to Fidelity and T. Rowe and saying, what would you like to see in your portfolio next year? Because if they can't flog it, you know, if someone's not going to buy it, they can't make any money. So it's more a problem that the public market has a limited appetite for more bullshit tech stuff. Not that you know, we don't want to go public. We all want to go public. It sounds awesome until you find out how much paperwork it is. Um, I think we actually have time for another question, so we'll a little bit. So as someone that uh, did everything, went through everything, experienced everything, what, what really excites you personally in the future? Oh, for the future? Or you mean like what gets me excited or what do I like about the future? I mean, like Two very different answers. Uh, yeah, so, so I was with eBay when we went public. I've been at early stage startups that grew like crazy. I've been an angel and now sort of VC-ish dude. So and they've all been fun. You know, so I, I, I definitely think learning is a big part of what motivates me. But the reality is what I have the most fun on is when I can break shit and make other people angry. Um, I was at a dinner for my old business school with the entrepreneurship faculty. And they're like, okay, so now you're like a VC dude. And... It takes years to find out how you're doing. So like on a daily, weekly basis, you're kind of missing that cadence of metrics of like, how's the company doing? So how do you measure yourself? And I literally said, the number of people angry at me. Like if I piss off a bunch of VCs, if I irritate the fuck out of someone, that's a good week. Because I'm trying to break things. And if you're a disruptor, the taxi guys are going to be really mad at you. Right? Like really mad, like burning cars down mad in France. Uh, that's a sign something's working. Like, I don't know why the media thinks that's a bad sign. That's a fucking awesome sign that they are burning to Ubers. Right? That tells you they are really out of choices. Um, so that gets me excited. Like, on, in terms of like what's changing in the world, I actually think this self driving shit is so amazing. I mean, I, I, I don't want to describe how weird it will be, but the closest I can come is I was in London with my teenage kids this summer for a week vacation, and we passed by a red phone booth, and they just looked at it, and they're like, what the fuck is that? And I was like, it's a booth you go into to make phone calls. And they're like, why the fuck would you do that? <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. Like, why would anybody go in a phone booth? Right? The, the analogy to that in self-driving cars, and, and the industry has really not talked about this, is today, my guess is there are somewhere between 500 and 800 car models. Like, how many does GM have? How many does Hyundai have? Right? Like, there's got to be 30 or 40 manufacturers that each have 20 models, including the station wagon, and the coupe and the right, it's gonna be like three in 10 years. They'll be big, small, and medium, right? So the amount of money that goes into R&D in the car industry is gonna go from, and these are all billion dollar platforms, literally over a billion dollars to develop a car. So think about two to 600 billion a year going to five and where all that money goes. Um, and then think about the fact that I use my car like 15% of the time. So the size of the market's going to shrink by like 80%. Like massive change. Single best paying job in America if you don't have a college degree is truck driver. That's going to be the first one to go. First one to go. Because the ROI is amazing. I mean, if I want to get shit from here to New York, 
I have to have two drivers who take turns. One of them sleeps. And the federal government won't let them work 12-hour shifts anymore because it's too scary. So now they work, I think it's either eight or 10-hour shifts, and they have to literally sit at a truck stop for four hours doing nothing. And they're paid super high because who wants to be in a smelly truck with some other guy for like four days straight? Like pair truck driving, cross country, really fast, is like the first place I put a robot because highways are pretty good and there aren't any stop signs and those guys are really expensive. So, you know, Uber's acquisition of auto is terrifying um, because to me, the, the, the truck driver job is the new factory job. It's the only job I can get that pays 50, 60, 70, $80,000 a year without a high school education. And that's gone, like soon. Last question. Regarding liquidity, with winner takes all markets, what is the concern about uh, some markets like self driving cars? There won't be enough VCs investing because you already have Lyft, you already have Uber. Who's going to try to invest in Coma or in somebody else? So, what's the question? Uh, do you think there will be a consolidation of the VCs instead of liquidity? They will just buy winners, take calls, big stakes, instead of buying 100 small ones and see which one goes to the end? Yeah. There aren't that many markets that are winner-take-all. There are a lot of markets that are winner-take-most or half. Um, it's actually pretty rare that you find winner-take-all. Um, I mean, eBay in auctions appeared to have a 90-plus percent share, but in fixed-price sale of random shit, I mean, they don't even have half anymore compared to Amazon in third-party, Amazon third-party alone. Um, I don't think Uber is at all in a winner-take-all take all market. Um, and in fact, I just invested in a company on Fleet that lets the merchant, like if you're a, a restaurant, you want to figure out who to have send your shit out to the customer. They pick between Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, Amazon Fresh, and a dude in a 10-year-old Datsun. They're like, sometimes Uber has surged, sometimes Grubhub charges something weird, like they'll, they'll literally like just move the transit around between multiple logistics providers. So, you know, I mean, DHL, UPS and FedEx are sort of an oligopoly, which is still a great place to be, but it's not a monopoly. Um, so I, I like even within self-driving cars, right, you auto got funded because it was self-driving trucks. There are these guys in New York, maybe someone can remind me of the name that is raising like a hundred million right now and they do a bus line. It's still a car, but it doesn't come to you. You go to it, and it just goes up and down like 42nd Street or up and down 98th Street. Um, and the point is, like, you don't have to wait for the lift line to drive way the fuck out of the way for whoever's ahead of you. We just go up and down this street. You can get on and off anytime you want, which is, you know, a novel, different approach to transportation, blah, blah, car, raised, I think, $100 million to do ride-sharing in Europe, which is basically hitchhiking, um, so I, I'm not worried about VCs. They'll find ways to waste money. Um, it's what they do, and, and there's just so many weird ways to waste money. My favorite one this week on the AI front was the industrial dishwasher that has a robot arm that grabs the dishes and stacks them properly so that the dish tray can go through the industrial dishwasher at, at like a casino that does you know 100,000 plates a day. So they're trying to get rid of dishwasher jobs? Yeah. Oh my God. Vegas is unionized, man. Unions suck. <laughs> right? And they're like, look, it's a little robot arm and it just picks up the dishes. Like, how hard is this? So uh, I was kind of like, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, Lemnos Labs had the hamburger maker machine. Right? Let's get rid of all those stupid McDonald's people that are protesting they want $15 an hour. Like, fuck that. We'll just robotize that too. So, I mean, the guy last night talking about that is actually worried about like where are the entry level jobs going to come from if we robotize everything. But we got rid of all the farm jobs and China got rid of all the manufacturing jobs and people still find ways to earn a living. So I'm, I'm less cataclysmically worried about that one. There'll be more artists. 
or more, you know, people doing movies in LA or something. Well, it's always a blast talking to you, and I always have fun. Thank you very much. Thanks.